Chemistry and catharsis in the periodic table. That the nobility of man, acquired in a hundred centuries of trial and error, lay in making himself the conqueror of matter, and that I had enrolled in chemistry because I wanted to maintain faithful to that nobility. That conquering matter is to understand it, and understanding matter is necessary to understanding the universe and ourselves. And that therefore, Mendeleev's periodic table, which just during those weeks we were laboriously learning to unravel, was poetry, loftier and more solemn than all the poetry we had swallowed down in Lecheo, and come to think of it, it even rhymed. Join us today as we explore the unexpected interrelations between chemistry, memory, and history in Primo Levi's The Periodic Table. I'm your host, Bob. Now please, sit back and enjoy today's edition of Lit Tips. There are some writers whose personal lived experiences are inseparable from their work. Writers who have lived lives so eventful, exciting, tragic, or baffling that to publish pure fiction and to not relate their own biographies would be considerable loss for readers everywhere. Primo Levi was one of these writers. His Periodic Table, a fictionalized memoir covering more than five tumultuous decades of Italian history, consists of 21 interconnected short stories, each named after an element on Dmitri Mendeleev's Periodic Table. A summary of Levy's life serves as a dual synopsis of the book. Born in turn in 1919, Primo Levi never aspired to be a professional writer. From an early age, his unshakable passion was for science, in particular, chemistry. He did appreciate literature and occasionally wrote poems, but strictly treated his writing as a hobby. Later educated and trained as a chemist, he chose to pursue full-time work in that field for his entire life. Because of this, Levy occupies a unique space in the canon of 20th century writers. It wasn't uncommon in the Romantic era for figures like Goethe to supplement their literary pursuits with forays into scientific exploration. But as the hard sciences and the humanities gradually became more specialized and developed their own communities, overlap became less and less frequent. With few exceptions, this continues to be the case today. Levy was only three years old when Benito Mussolini came to power in Italy. Levy's exceptional grades allowed him to enroll in Massimo di Zegli Royal Gymnasium a year early. In addition to being the youngest student in his class, he was additionally bullied for being the only Jew. Under Mussolini, all young boys were expected to join the young fascist group, the Avantguardisti. Despite his heritage, Levy was no exception. He avoided the militarized elements of the group as much as possible and spent most of his time in the mountains with its ski division. Life for the Levy family under the dictatorship took on a degree of extreme pragmatism. Counter to their beliefs, Levy agreed to his father's suggestion that he join the fascist militia in order for Levy to dodge the Navy draft. When the Italian racial laws were passed in 1938, Levy was summarily expelled from the militia. Before the racial laws were passed, Jews were still allowed to hold prominent status in Italian society. These rights were stripped with shocking rapidity. Publication of the works of Jewish writers was banned, and they were barred from admission to the country's universities. Levy once again managed to gain entrance into an educational institution early, and was able to remain enrolled at the University of Turin because he had gotten in just before the passage of the racial laws. The university's labs provided Levy with a much needed refuge from the cascading troubles plaguing his country. He spent countless hours lost in research and experimenting. In chemistry, Levy found an enlightenment that struck him far greater than religion ever had. The chemistry and physics on which we fed, besides being in themselves nourishments vital in themselves, were the antidotes to fascism because they were clear and distinct and verifiable at every step, and not a tissue of lies and emptiness like the radio and newspapers. The inherent stupidity and incoherence of the fascist ideology became all the more clear to Levy as his studies progressed. Its adherents had a fixation on the natural order and purity of society, but Levy knew all too well that such goals were entirely unrealistic, and not just for reasons of sheer, obvious morality. The same natural order in question runs completely counter to this repulsive ethos, ruminating on the fact that for the element zinc to dissolve in sulfuric acid, the zinc must contain impurities, Levy states, In order for the wheel to turn, for life to be lived, impurities are needed. And the impurities of impurities in the soil, too, as is known, if it is to be fertile. Dissension, diversity, the grain of salt and mustard are needed. Fascism does not want them, forbids them, and that's why you're not a fascist. It wants everybody to be the same, and you are not. But immaculate virtue does not exist either, or if it exists, it is detestable. Levy faced yet more difficulties while looking for work upon his graduation. He eventually found an employer who tasked him with extracting nickel from an asbestos mine. Levy during this time lived under another name and used falsified papers to keep the authorities from learning his true identity. The work he and his assistant undertook at the asbestos mine yielded no results. When it became clear that the project was futile, Levy took up an offer from a university friend to find work at a factory in Milan. 
Here he was assigned to yet another impossible project, curing diabetes using a combination of phosphorus and vegetable matter. The job was absurd, but the company, A. Wander Limited, was Swiss, and therefore gave Levy hope that he would not be subject to firing under the racial laws. But then something unexpected happened. In 1943, Mussolini was deposed and replaced by King Victor Emmanuel III. Allied bombing had ravaged Italy for months, and the intent of the coup was for the government to broker an armistice with the Allies. But before negotiations could even begin, Germany invaded and freed Mussolini from prison. He was reinstalled as a figurehead, but it was now the Germans who truly ran Italy. Knowing that the future would only get more dire from here on out, Levy returned to Turin and fled into the mountains of the Aosta Valley. Wartime history in Italy abounds with tales of brave partisan resistance fighters like Salvatore Giuliano, anti-fascist citizens who rose up to defend their country from its domestic enemies. In the Aosta Valley, Levy joined one of these factions. He strongly believed in the cause, but he was a thinker, not a fighter at his core. And in 1943, he and several of his fellow partisans were arrested by militiamen. Levy only evaded execution by admitting to his Jewish heritage. For his honesty, he was sent away to the Monovitz concentration camp. Levy recalls his detainment at the camp in vivid, horrid detail in his first published work, If This Is a Man. He was held there until the Soviets liberated the camp in 1945. Thousands of detainees had been evacuated when news of the Red Army's approach became known. But Levy was spared as he was left behind in the camp's infirmary while battling illness. Levy returned to turn a radically changed, traumatized man. He began scribbling notes here and there that would form the basis for If This Is A Man. His life gradually regained some sense of normality after he was hired by a paint factory owned by the DuPont Company. In 1946, Levy met Lucia Morpugo, whom he married in 1947. They would remain together until his death. 1947 also saw the publication of If This Is A Man by a small publishing house. It was well received, but did not gain broad attention outside of Italy right away. The specter of Monovitz haunted Levy for the rest of his life. In the 1950s, he joined numerous organizations dedicated to Holocaust remembrance. When dealing with senior German clients, an unsettling number of whom had not only been complicit but had actively supported the fascist regime, he went so far as to make sure he wore short-sleeved shirts that wouldn't obscure the number tattooed on his forearm. If This Is A Man was republished in 1958, this time in numerous translated editions. It was hailed by fellow writer Italo Calvino, who said the book has pages of authentic narrative power which will remain in our memory among the most beautiful of the literature on the Second World War. Levy's stature as a writer grew, and while science continued to be his main source of income, over the next few years he published The Truce, another memoir of his experiences immediately following the Monovitz liberation, and The Sixth Day, a collection of short sci-fi stories. Levy's writing was cathartic, giving him the means to, if not overcome, at least understand the trials he and his fellow countrymen had been through. The Periodic Table, published in 1975, can be seen as his life's work. It takes the same themes explored in his earlier publications and examines them with a meditative air gained through 30 years of hindsight, as opposed to the chillingly clinical sense of visceral terror depicted in If This Is A Man. The scars are permanent, but there is a sense of acceptance as Levy recounts the previous decades. In a 2019 article for Chemistry World celebrating Levy's 100th birthday, Philip Ball writes of the periodic table, but here too is chemistry as metaphor for human relations, a trick not tried since Goethe's 1809 novel Elective Affinities. Inert argon and its sibling noble gases represent Levy's ancestors, Jewish settlers in Turin from Spain, alien like Xenon, hidden like Krypton, reserved and separate in an attitude of dignified abstentation. Even following the publication of the periodic table, Levy was not able to escape the demons of his past. He continued to write, publishing stories, novels, essays, and poems until the mid-80s. In April 1987, Levy fell from the third-story landing of his apartment to the ground floor. His death was officially ruled a suicide, but the ruling has been strongly contested by several of Levy's close friends and associates. Levy's abrupt death was a tragedy, but the power of his work, particularly the periodic table, still stands. For all its dark subject matter, the periodic table is infused with Levy's unique sense of humor and his keen eye for observing and depicting humanity at its best and worst. It is by turns chilling and inspiring as it traces the rise, reign, and fall of Italian fascism before examining the fallout and continued effects of the regime in the post-war era, using Levy as a stand-in not just for Italian Jews, but for the Italian people as a whole. All along, Levy turns to chemistry and the rigid, immutable nature of the elements and their myriad reactions when exposed to one another to make sense of the momentous events he has witnessed and survived. The book concludes on a less autobiographical note, with the story detailing the millennia-spanning odyssey of a carbon atom. The atom is at different points mined, photosynthesized, eaten, and drunk. Eventually, it is breathed in by Levy himself, at which point he writes, This soul belongs to a brain, and it is my brain, the brain of me who is writing. 
and the cell in question, and within it the atom in question, is in charge of my writing, in a gigantic minuscule game which nobody has yet described. It is that which at this instant, issuing out of a labyrinthine tangle of yeses and noes, makes my hand run along a certain path on the paper. Mark it with these volutes that are signs, a double snap, up and down, between two levels of energy, guides this hand of mine to impress on the paper this dot here, this one. We hope that you enjoyed this edition of Lit Tips. As always, hit that like button if you like what we're doing, subscribe for more videos on literature from your favorites to the plain obscure, hit that bell if you want to be notified when videos drop, and leave a comment with your thoughts on this video along with suggestions for any books or authors you would like us to cover in future episodes. Until next time, keep reading.